Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Flint. My name is Chris Monk, and I'll be your worship associate today. If you are new to us, let me tell you a little bit about us. We are an inclusive church that welcomes everyone, regardless of your age, gender, sexuality, education. If you are searching for a church that believes love, the quest for justice, and the use of reason are the most important things, then we quite possibly are a congregation for you. If you'd like to know more about UUism or our congregation, please feel free to contact one of our ministers or our church office. That contact information can be found at uuflint.org. Now for some announcements. We have to have announcements. March is Women's History Month. We almost let it go by. This is a special time to celebrate past victories in the fight for women's rights and to continue our work to ensure women truly have equal rights. Our Canvas drive through last weekend was a wonderful event for all involved. I still have my flower, and it is still blooming, that I received. Thanks to everyone who participated. The 2021-2022 pledge packets have been mailed to those not able to drive through. We are asking that all pledge forms be returned by April 30th. Contact Sandra Murphy or the ministers if you have questions or would like to make a pledge. All pledges, no matter what the amount, are welcome and needed. Show your support for Black Lives Matter and make a difference. Please join the members of Flint's Woodside Church on the courthouse lawn every Thursday from 1 to 2 p.m. and support the Black Lives Matter movement. See your e-update for details or call Jerry. Lastly, join us for coffee hour after the service today. We'll be on Zoom. The meeting ID code can be found on our website, on our Facebook page, and in the e-update. We will now begin our service with a prelude by Jennifer Howard and a slideshow of defiant dames who changed the world.
our chalice lighting this morning. May this light fill us with gratitude as we remember the wondrous gifts that our community shares with all who are in need. May it remind us to hold precious one another and the world which provides us with sustenance and beauty. Would you please join me in reciting our covenant? Recognizing the richness of diversity, the beauty and wonder of shared worship, and the transforming power of love and service, we gather as a sacred intentional community to freely seek knowledge and truth, to celebrate the fullness of life, and by our actions to increase goodness and justice. And he grows. The narcissistic sky stares hours on end into the pond, reaches down with fingertips of rain to touch possessively, admiring. She ripples, and he, angry that he can no longer see himself, sends down a storm, and she grows. An excerpt from Backlash, The Undeclared War Against American Women by Susan Faludi. The woman movement of the mid-19th century launched at the 1848 Seneca Falls Right Convention and articulated most famously by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, pressed for suffrage and an array of liberties, education, jobs, marital and property rights, voluntary motherhood, health, and dress reform. But by the end of the century, a cultural counter-reaction crushed women's appeals for justice. Women fell back before a barrage of warnings virtually identical to today's, voiced by that era's lineup of Ivy League scholars, religious leaders, medical experts, and press pundits. Educated women of this era, too, were said to be falling victim to a male shortage. The redundancy of the spinster gentlewoman in the parlance of the time inspired debate in state legislatures and frenzied scholarly research. A marriage study even made the rounds in 1895, asserting that only 28% of college-educated women could find men to get married. They, too, faced a so-called infertility ep epidemic, this one induced by brain-womb conflict, as a Harvard professor's best-selling book defined it in 1873. Victorian women who worked who were likewise said to be suffering a sort of early career burnout, quote, exhaustion of the immune nervous system, and losing their femininity to hermaphroditism. Women during this time were accused of causing race suicide of the white race, also of being the responsible for the crisis happening in the American family, for the increase of divorce rates, and in fact, there were so many divorce restriction laws made and even ended in South Carolina banning divorce outright in uh, between 1889 and 1906. By the late 1800s, Congress outlawed the distribution of contraceptives, and a majority of states criminalized abortion, both for the first time in our nation's history. I won't, and I can't, and I don't, and I shan't. And I will speak my mind if I die for it. 
Men tell us tis fit that wives should submit to their husbands submissively weakly. That whatever they say, their wives should obey unquestioning, stupidly, meekly. Our husbands would make us their own dictums take without ever a wherefore or why for it. But I don't, and I can't, and I won't, and I shan't. No, I will speak my mind if I die for it. For we know it's all fudge to say man's the best judge of what should be and shouldn't, and so on. That women should bow, nor attempt to say how she considers that matters should go on. I never yet gave up myself as a slave, however my husband might try for it. For I can't, and I won't, and I shan't, and I don't. But I will speak my mind if I die for it. And all ladies, I hope, who with husbands to cope with the rights of a sex will not trifle. We all, if we choose our tongues but to use, can all our positions unstifle. Let man, if he will, then bid us be still, and the silent, a price you pay high for it. For we won't, and we can't, and we don't, and we shan't. Let us all speak our minds if we die for it. It is with sadness that for the second week in a row, we pause to remember the victims of another mass shooting. Let us hope that laws are changed to prevent these tragedies from continuing. Our meditation this morning is Warning by Jenny Joseph. When I am an old woman, I shall wear purple with a red hat, which doesn't go and doesn't suit me. And I shall spend my pension on brandy and summer gloves and satin sandals, and say, we've no money for butter. I shall sit on the pavement when I'm tired, and gab gobble up samples in shops, and press alarm bells, and run my stick along the public railings, and make up for the sobriety of my youth. I shall go out in slippers in the rain, and pick the flowers in other people's gardens, and learn to spit. You can wear terrible shirts and grow more fat and eat three pounds of sausages at a go, or only bread and pickles for a week, and hoard pens and pencils and beer mats and things in boxes. But now we must have clothes that keep us dry and pay our rent and not swear in the street and set a good example for the children. We must have friends to dinner and read the papers. But maybe I ought to practice a little now, so people who know me are not too shocked and surprised when suddenly I'm old and start to wear purple.
your enemy, a sample of sexist quotes. Whenever a woman dies, there is one quarrel less on earth. German proverb. Never trust a woman, even though she has given you 10 sons. Chinese proverb. In childhood, a woman must be subject to her father. In youth, to her husband. When her husband is dead, to her sons. A woman must never be free of subjugation. The Hindu code of Manu. I thank thee, O Lord, that thou hast not created me a woman. Daily Orthodox Jewish prayer for men. The five worst infirmities that afflict a female are indocility, discontent, slander, jealousy, and silliness. Such is the stupidity of women's character that it is incumbent upon her in every particular to distrust herself and to obey her husband. Confucius Marriage Manual. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjugation. I suffer not a woman to absurd authority over men, but to be in silence. St. Paul. If the wife does not obey thee at signal and at a glance, separate from her. Sirach, chapter 25, verse 26. Thus the whole education of women ought to be relative to men, to please them, to be useful to them, to make themselves loved and honored by them, to educate them when young, to care for them when grown, to counsel them, to console them, and to make life agreeable and sweet to them. These are the duties of women at all times and should be taught them from their infancy. Rousseau. All witchcraft comes from carnal lust, which is in woman insatiable. Kramer and Springer Inquisitors, around 1486. A woman who is guided by the head and not by the heart is a social pestilence. She has all the defects of the passionate and affectionate woman with none of her compensations. She is without pity, without love, without virtue, without sex. Blaze. Nature intended women to be our slaves. They are our property. We are not theirs. They belong to us, just as a tree that bears fruit belongs to a gardener. Women are nothing more than machines for producing children. Napoleon Bonaparte. It would be preposterously naive to suggest that a B.A. can be made as attractive to girls as a marriage license. Dr. Grayson Kurt, former president, Columbia University. Most women have no characters at all. Alexander Pope. Regard the society of women as a necessary unpleasantness of social life and avoid it as much as possible. Count Leo Tolstoy. And a woman is only a woman. But a good cigar is a smoke. Kipling. The only alliance I would make with the women's liberation movement is in bed. Abby Hoffman. We chose High Plains Drifter, a 1973 Clint Eastwood yarn. We turned it off after the first half an hour. Eastwood plays a stranger that walks into a small western town, shoots three town troublemakers, encounters a sassy woman, and then drags her into a barn and rapes her to give her a lesson in manners. We learn that that woman is a trollop and obviously asked for it. The stranger is a hero asked to rid the town of the bad guys. 
highly praised by reviewers in 1973, a recent more enlightened review of the movie from 2015 still calls it a fantastic Western, despite the politically incorrect rape scene. So, rape is not a crime against women, not violating, not sexual assault. It's just not politically correct. People across America seem shocked in 2017 when some very high profile people began to be accused of sexual harassment and sexual assault. It was called the Me Too movement. Slowly, we learned that there were thousands upon thousands of average women and abusers that had gone ignored for years. Sometimes it takes famous people to stand up before the rest of us are noticed for either our triumphs or our traumatic experiences. Like many of the women that you saw on the slideshow this morning, they may have shaped the country, but we never knew their names until now. Catherine Stinson, the aviator, was very good at what she did, but her gender kept her from pursuing some of her dreams. Only the fourth woman in America to receive a pilot's license, she performed many firsts in aviation tricks, along with setting numerous speed and endurance records. She was the first woman to be sworn in by the U.S. Postal Service to deliver mail by air, and the first woman to fly to China and Japan. She could even take a plane apart and put it back together again. But when World War I broke out, she volunteered to serve, but she was refused. She ended up training dozens of Canadian military pilots while she raised money for the Red Cross with exhibition flying and later became an ambulance driver in Europe. There is where she contracted influenza, which eventually developed into tuberculosis and it ended her flying career. She died at the age of 86, unknown to most Americans. You may not have heard of a woman named Frances Wright either. Born in Scotland and orphaned at the age of two, she was moved to England where she had a vast college library where she read everything she could about America and was determined to travel there to see how the American experiment was going. She corresponded with Thomas Jefferson and told him that she felt that America was a nation of freedom and equality. She wrote to him, women are assuming their place as thinking beings, not in despite of the men, but chiefly in consequence of their enlarged views. Later, I'm afraid she would learn that they were not as enlarged as she had hoped. On a visit to America, she visited Monticello, and many in the household said she had masculine proclivities, and that she always seemed to be wearing the wrong thing. People who met her often marveled at how comfortable she was talking with learned men. She once commented, trust me, the mind has no sex, but what habit and education give it. Wright became wrapped up in American politics and became most interested in abolition. She thought a practical plan to eradicating slavery would be to form a biracial community. These ideas of free love scared her prominent friends and she eventually abandoned those plans. So then to spread her objectives, she became the first woman to edit a journal and the first woman to give a popular lecture series before both men and women in the audience. Her aims included abandoning capital punishment, closing down intolerant religious institutions, increasing the status of women through equal education, rights of married women, divorce laws, and birth control, and accepting relationships between two people regardless of their sexes. She became so controversial that she needed a bodyguard. 
Due to her frequent travel between America and Europe, her husband eventually asked her for a divorce. In this, she also made history, as she was given money for her very own property. The harassment eventually got the best of her, and she halted her public speaking and writing. She died virtually unknown in Cincinnati. But that's why we celebrate Women's History Month. So people like Frances and Catherine can be remembered for their contributions to who we are as women today. Perhaps we can thank them for giving us a little more courage than we might have had when we faced obstacles because we are women. Nevertheless, one wonders how many unknown women have suffered. Especially when you hear that televangelist Pat Robertson said that feminism is a socialist, anti-family, political movement that encourages women to leave their husbands, kill their children, practice witchcraft, destroy capitalism, and become lesbians. Until the 1960s, the best option for a woman was to become a teacher, but only until she was married. My mother-in-law's mother hid her marriage and subsequent pregnancy for as long as she possibly could because she was a school teacher. But it was obvious eventually that she was with child. The principal helped her out and promptly fired her so that she could take on the most important role for women, wife and mother. When I entered the workforce, it was expected that women worked. Unfortunately, unbeknownst to me, throughout my career, other things were expected as well. It started in my college internship. My supervisor told me one morning in his office never to wear pink again. He said it made me look weak, and women already had trouble being taken seriously. When I arrived home that night, I threw out that pretty pink silk blouse. It may seem inconsequential, but it changed the way I felt about myself and what I wore for decades to come. That evening, I remembered a poem from junior high, the one from our meditation this morning. At the time I read it, I was nothing of a nonconformist. I was pretty straight-laced, a straight-A student. But throwing caution to the wind and wearing any color I liked when I was older somehow appealed to me back then. That day, after the incident in my supervisor's office, I longed for old age to come as quickly as possible. From then on, I was especially conscious of what I wore and how I looked in my professional life. I didn't know then that would be the least of my experiences gone bad. I soon began to understand what some male supervisors expected of their female employees like tolerating them leaning up against them in narrow hallways, like smiling at their comments on what you're wearing or should wear, like entertaining clients with alcohol and drugs, or happily listening to sexual innuendos and jokes. While all this was happening, Anita Hill was testifying before Congress and not being listened to. It made young people like me feel awfully impotent against the men in power taking advantage of us. And it was an abuse of power. And it is no secret that throughout history, men tend to have most of the power. People in power will do what is needed to maintain it and keep you in your position that is not in power. It happens with races, sexual identities, classes, and genders. And it's been happening so long that it's become normalized. The Me Too movement started to put the brakes on sexual harassment so victims may have a chance at justice and abu abusers may eventually face consequences. But that doesn't mean it's over. We also need to legalize the right for women to be equal. 
If you think we already have it by law, then you would be part of the nearly 75% of the Americans who mistakenly believe there is currently a legal remedy against sex discrimination. The Equal Rights Amendment was never passed. The only right women are currently guaranteed is the right to vote. That was given in 1920. 1973, we could have legal abortions, but that is slowly eroding state by state. The ERA was first penned in 1923 by Alice Paul, a suffragist, an activist with three law degrees. With rewrites, it was ready to be made, by, made into law in 1972, but it is still not part of the Constitution. We need it because most women don't have the confidence to find their voice without it. Luckily, once I became a Unitarian Universalist, I learned about equality and justice, and I gained the self-esteem and belief in myself to stand up and tell people I wasn't comfortable with their language or their actions. And I did pretty well until I went to seminary in my late 20s, and then I reverted to something of the timid girl in that pink blouse again. But here's why. At that time, our denomination was primarily controlled by older, white, heterosexual men. When you start the ministerial process, you're required to meet with experienced ministers to make sure you understand what you're getting into. By chance, I met with two of what I'll call the good old boys. One told me that a congregation would eat me alive with my look of innocence and schoolgirl clothing. The second minister told me that I had no business in the seminary. I'd never make it. And the UUA needed more men, not weak women. I should save my money and go home. Obviously, I sought other advice, and I stuck it out. Today, things are done differently, and people like that are held more accountable for their actions and their language. We also have a woman president of the UUA. And I hear that people don't fear the retribution that I felt when I was a young minister. And of course, I went on and worked in churches, and I wouldn't say I exuded strength and confidence all the time, but I held my own. The scars from the past were just under the surface, of course. But that was until I remembered two other pretty incredible women, one who was very well known, and one who should have been. Among all the amazing things that Maya Angelou did in her life, she was also once a single mom of a kindergartner, working two jobs to make ends meet. She shopped at secondhand shops to find what she called the most beautiful reds and oranges and greens and pinks and teals and turquoises. And she said she mixed the colors and patterns to top off her ensembles. And she put on beads, lots of them, the cheaper they were the more she wore. She recalls that Southern black women might have called what she wore get-ups. Well, once her son was old enough to notice that other people stared at her, she toned it down a little. But then, as she got older, she went back to what she calls her colors, and she wore what felt good to her. She wrote, Lots of people have ideas about what is right to wear. Sometimes those decisions are made by other people and are supposed to make life better. Instead, choose clothes that make you feel like you and make you happy. And if you see pictures of Maya as an older woman, you can see how beautiful, elegant, and confident she was. My four foot eight grandmother held herself in the same way. Now, I wouldn't call my grandma Pete elegant necessarily, but confident and beautiful, yes. Now she might have been tiny, but as a former bartender, she knew how to get your attention, even if it meant throwing a little something at you. And then she'd smile and you'd forget all about it. 
She had short salt and pepper curly hair and billowing tops and jackets that made her look a lot bigger than she was. She walked as though she were gliding across the floor, but if you didn't get out of her way, you'd receive an arm in the small of your back to push you along. She wore inexpensive jewelry and loud colors on her small frame. The brighter the fabric and the more complicated the patterns, the more she loved it. Most of her get-ups were handmade. And they could be a bit embarrassing to those around her at times, but intriguing too. You always noticed her, and that's the way she liked it. I realize now Maya and Grandma Pete chose clothes that accentuated their confidence and made them happy. They felt good about who they were, and that only magnified their beauty. They never dressed to impress, yet they did just the same because who they were shined through. There's a power in that, a confidence that might allow us to be someone we may not have considered before, like a young minister, a young black civil rights activist who would be awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, or a very tiny but strong bartender. I wonder if all the women who have made history at some point found some little extra thing that helped them accomplish what they did. Maybe it was something they read, or saw, or even what they wore. Today, women are setting their own expectations and making their own choices. Sometimes we choose pink. Plenty of defiant dames have risen above those who aim to keep them down. More women are being heard and being remembered. And I hope many of them are wearing purple. May it be so. I am woman, hear me roar, in numbers too big to ignore, cause I've come too far to go back and pretend, cause I've heard it all before, and I've been down there on the floor, no one's ever Yes, I've paid the price, but look 
Thank you. That was so inspiring. Now it's time for generosity. Poet and civil, right, ask, civil rights activist Maya Angelou tells us, I have found that among its other benefits, giving liberates the soul of the giver. Giving of your time, talent, and treasure is what can liberate your soul. Consider giving online at uuflint.org or by sending a check to the church office. And thank you for all the gifts that you do give. Our closing words are from Emily Dickinson. Find ecstasy in life. The mere sense of living is joy enough. Now let us extinguish our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Mm -hmm.